Hey guys, uh, I want to thank everybody who is here right now live and who's watching the recording. Uh, today on What's Your Angle, uh, Max is with me, which is phenomenal. Hey, Max. Thanks for having me back. Sorry, I missed the last one. Your deal, man. So I'm glad you're here too. And then uh, Adam Pugh, who I've known for a long time, and Adam's been on, on the podcast before, and uh, really grateful that you're here. Uh, Adam's an attorney that, we work for, that we've worked with for years and specializes in a number of things, but uh, does a lot of work for homeowners associations, a lot of work for builders and for neighbors. Adam, do you want to tell everyone kind of what you do, where you are, and uh, and what we're going to talk about today? Sure. Thanks for having me, Eric. Uh, my name is Adam Pugh. I'm at the law firm of Cable Pugh. I've been a lawyer for almost 20 years now, uh, working predominantly in the area of real estate, uh, real estate litigation, commercial litigation, those types of things. Uh, over the last 15 years, my practice is focused on um, issues involving homeowners associations and deed restrictions. Uh, we still do a lot of other things, but but that's that's what we focus on right now. And, and I think that might that might lend itself to the topic for today. Definitely. Uh, we were talking a little bit off screen, or I'm sorry, uh, before the show. And uh, you mentioned you, you tend to stay busy when the market's up and when the market's down. And uh, you do a lot of work contractually and you do a lot of work with litigation. Um, tell me how those sort of overlap. You know, how do deed restrictions come into play with contract work? And then how do they come into play uh, with litigation? Sure. Well, deed restrictions are all obviously going to be attached to any parcel of property. Um, in the state of Texas, you've got to get pretty far outside the city of Remitz, uh in, a, in an unincorporated area of a county uh, before you you don't have any deed restrictions. So if it's a residential property, deed restrictions will control things like um, you know how many units you can build on a lot, what the property is supposed to look like, what you can do, how you have to maintain the property, um, can there be any commercial use whatsoever, and then of course. If we're talking about a commercial property, then those those deed restrictions will talk about what types of businesses you can have, what types of structures, uh, upper and lower limits on square footage, those types of things. So you've always got to be paying attention to your deed restrictions um, and the other matters of record filed uh, that are going to show on you know Schedule B of a title commitment, just to know how to develop a piece of property, what you may be permitted to do, what you will be specifically excluded from doing, and, and those kinds of things. And then of course. Um, and that's that's with respect to to transactions. Um, and then, of course, when we we go down the line and people have disputes over deed restrictions, then litigation can ensue and it can be complicated and messy. Um, a lot of times we're interpreting deed restrictions. We, we have fights over what the term mobile home means. Um, we have fights over what the term commercial use means. Um, we're fighting over short term and long term rentals. And those types of restrictions and, and 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 everything else you can imagine. So the the issues go from what can I build to what can I do, and and as you I'm sure know, people will fight about all that stuff. Yeah, that thank you. That's a great that's a great primer. And yeah, people do love to fight about this stuff a lot. Um, I think so. A, a a great place to start here is you know what can I build right? And uh, we're talking about the home initiative. And the home initiative is a really well-intentioned uh, effort. The city and city council has gone through and are continuing to go through. They're trying to get more density. So they're you know, taking the minimum lot size down. They're saying you can put more units on a lot. Uh, they're allowing you to build more square footage if you do two units or three units, things like that. And you know, agents and, and developers have been really focused on the changes that the home initiative and the zoning will allow. What isn't discussed is what do deed restrictions allow? So question for you, you know, how are deed restrictions similar and different to, uh, to city zoning? Sure. Well, it's a great question and a great place to start. So obviously zoning and deed restrictions are, are very different things. For example, we're talking today uh, about the city of Austin's home initiative, which modifies zoning and building guidelines, which are enforced by the city of Austin. Um, and so when the city is in charge of the process, that's one thing. Um, but when we talk about deed restrictions, we're generally talking about uh, private agreements that are filed of record in the official public records for the county that run with the land and, and operate as restrictions. And just just to hit it, hit it as we, as we start here, um, the home initiative that will change some of the density requirements and, and obviously other things um, with the city of Austin does not affect deed restrictions. In other words, 
a home initiative will not trump deed restrictions. So while, for example, the home initiative says that a, a minimum lot size is 1,800 square feet, if you have a deed restriction uh, that is on file that that requires the minimum lot size to be larger than that, or that there has to be, um, you know, a certain number of uh, dwellings per um, building unit, and it defines building unit, that will not allow you to build on less than 1,800 square feet simply because the city has enacted this new this new home um, provision. So that's really interesting. You know, I'm certainly uh, a layman more than uh, you and, and Eric being that, you know, I'm, a, I'm on the lending side. And while we have deed restrictions, I don't deal a whole lot with them. Um, but, you know, from from one of the things that I've heard from a lot of folks is the concern that, you know, right now we have certain minimum lot sizes in our area, but now the city's making this change and it's going to apply to all light sizes. So anybody from, you know, Terrytown to Northwest Hills to uh, University Hills, they're going to be able to to make these changes. Um, and what you're saying is that's not true. That's right. And, you know, that's typical. And, and I frankly don't blame people that the, the way that zoning and, you know, site development plans and deed restrictions and all these various um, limitations and entitlements apply to real property. It's a complicated landscape. And so you hear the, the, the short, the short little soundbite on the local news uh, about how the city of Austin is changing, changing development um, for the future. And, and people start to worry, does that mean my neighbor is going to build a, a five story uh, condo in their backyard and then sell that off um, without me having any say in it? And I think primarily um, the answer is going to be no. And, and I think in most neighborhoods, especially the ones where folks are most concerned, um, there are going to be deed restrictions that prohibit this this kind of development. I do think there's going to be lots of opportunity. When this when this first started several years ago, one of the associates in our firm came up with this idea that we could market this to developers and call it "sell your backyard." And while I might disagree that that's a catchy phrase that uh, is going to catch on and, and, and be marketable. The idea seemed to make sense, and it seemed like something that that would would likely take off, especially with the cost of land being so high and the cost of available lots within the city limits. Uh, you know, there's, there's a serious supply and demand issue there. Um, but if you look at the numbers since the original limit, you know, lowering of, uh, of lot size requirements, I mean, we're less than 100 of these things have been applied for and granted since it's happened. So the first thing I would tell somebody who's concerned about this is th the volume doesn't suggest that it's a big problem. Now, of course, if there's 60 approved and, and one of those is behind you and it bothers you, well, that's a problem. But the odds are that's not gonna, that's not gonna be happening for you. I think the other direction to look at this is what are the opportunities for folks that want to develop property um, because I think there's going to be a lot more opportunities out there than there are going to be issues with neighbors um, because because the deed restrictions already allow uh, the development that, that people are worried about. So I, I will say um, what I've seen, and, and it, deed restrictions are interesting because the city, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but, but uh, city planning doesn't take deed restrictions to, into account in any way, shape, or form. Is that, that correct? I think I think it, that's probably fair to say. Um, I've had conversations with with the zoning and planning um, commission and, and other officers, uh, code enforcement officers, who will mention deed restrictions in passing. But it's usually tangential to the conversation. Like, well, you know, your client is asking for permission to do this. They, can they even do it under the deed restrictions? Um, but you're correct in 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 the city's consideration of the approval of, of site plans and projects and and that kind of thing, they're, they're not supposed to look at deed restrictions. That's a separate consideration that the, the developer's attorney is supposed to be, supposed to be paying attention to. Yeah. So I, a big concern, and you know, I'm, I'm in Northwest Hills and I've lived in Allendale and these areas are completely deed restricted. Uh, you know, people are worried that can we, you know, are we going to see fourplexes on, on Mesa? You know, Mesa's, there's a, a bus route on it. Uh, I'm not sure if Home Initiative will allow, uh, will, will allow that 
that, that much density on these lots, but let's say they will. If, if the zoning will allow it, you can get it approved per the city, but then what happens? Somebody, somebody wants to build a fourplex. What do the neighbors do at that point in time? Well, at that time, you know, if they're really trying to, to stop this from happening, they need to, they need to review their deed restrictions. And as you probably know, a homeowners association are typically in the position to enforce deed restrictions, but they're not at any point ever the sole authority for, for doing so. So if your neighbor is violating your, your restrictive covenants for your community, even if you're in a homeowners association, certainly you should reach out to the, the manager or to the, the board members of the association and ask them to enforce the deed restrictions. But if they refuse to, or they don't have the budget, or they simply don't have the will to do it, um, you are always entitled to individually enforce those deed restrictions, as long as you're also a member of the community um, and, and you're also bound by those restrictions. What does that look like? I mean, do you start with a cease and desist? Do you go straight to court? What do, what do, neighbor, what do neighbors generally do? It, it depends on what stage you're in. If, if, they're, you know, if you see somebody out there staking the corners of a foundation that looks, looks to be enormous in their backyard, you know, I always encourage people to, to talk to their neighbors. You know, I might knock on the door and, and ask, hey, what's going on, Bill? And if they're just going to build a, if they're just building a pool instead of, you know, building a fourplex, then, then you, you've saved everybody some issues. But yeah, we would usually start with a cease and desist letter. Um, it's usually when the concrete trucks show up at about 3 a.m. Um, that people start to get really concerned. That beep, beep, beep of a, of a contract, of a concrete truck backing up uh, to pour a foundation um, has, has initiated many lawsuits. Uh, but I do start with a cease and desist. We, we give them a short deadline. We ask them to, you know, it, we'll say something like, it looks like you're doing this. If that's what you're doing, it's a violation. We ask you to stop. If it's not what you're doing, hey, let us know what your plans are so that we can have a, 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 an intelligent conversation about what is and isn't allowed in the neighborhood. More often than not, uh, folks will ignore that letter if they're up to no good. And then we file a lawsuit. And depending on the, the stage of the construction, if there's something that we think we can do to stop them from putting something permanent in place, like a foundation or, you know, the framing of the walls or, or something like that, we'll, we'll run into court and try to get a temporary restraining order within the first few days of seeing it go up. And, and that gives us some, some leverage uh, because we're able to stop the construction from happening. But judges are happy to sign those orders because if I'm right and the structure shouldn't be there in the first place, then what we're doing is we're actually benefiting the owner who's going to have to demo uh, the inappropriate structure in the first place. So that's something that we can that we can usually do to enforce the restrictions. Is so I see on my end uh, I own a property uh, in um, Highland uh, Highland Highland Hills over uh, Lamar and Guadalupe, and there's all this uh, commercial space uh, right as you know up and down Lamar between St. John's and 35 and, and really everywhere. So I get these letters from time to time that says, hey, uh, you know, we bought this building or we're buying this building or we're trying to change something. And then I've got to go, uh, you know, either vote on it uh, or, or object to it. Um, you know, and to be perfectly honest, I get those letters and I'm like, well, I, I don't really care. I, I, I toss them. I, I don't have time to go deal with that. As a bill, if I if I'm trying to develop something, is that is that a requirement, or is this them just trying to? Is it because in that area there are deed restrictions uh, prohibiting what they want to do, so they're trying to change the deed restrictions? What's the deal with that? Do you know? Yeah, there's a there's a call for what we call the comment or a publicly, you know, a meeting open to the public. That's generally going to be, a, you know, a municipal um, change, some change in use permit, uh, the granting of a license for uh, from the TABC, something like that. You, you won't see one of those invitations to come comment um, from an HOA or, or from some other committee that's responsible for enforcing deed restrictions. Those types of meetings that, you know, sometimes you see the sign put up on a, on a vacant lot that says there's going to be a meeting at a particular time, um, you know, that dates back hundreds of years to when um, people either got their news on the town bulletin board or, uh, or, or from w walking past a piece of property. But we still do it that way in Texas. Um, for whatever reason. But yeah, if you see that invitation, that's going to be a governmental um, regulation that's about to change, whether it be zoning, site plan, conditional use permits, or alcoholic beverages, almost every time. Will, and Adam, 
if a neighbor wants to change the deed restrictions, they do have to get a certain number of, of signatures. Is that correct? Well, that's true. So, so with respect to say, you know, uh, uh, um, restrictive covenants down in the declaration for homeowners association, for example, uh, chapter two and out of the property code says that if you can get 67% of the owners to agree, you can change anything in there you want. So if there was a, a, a provision, for example, um, you know, one of the things that we can talk about today too, are the types of restrictive covenants that would prohibit somebody from, for example, selling their backyard, right? Taking a, taking a trunk to the backyard. And, and the easiest way to do that is not through a resubdivision, division, but usually through the filing of a condominium regime. So you take your, your, your yard, um, you have a survey done, um, you create a condominium plat and you, you, you section off um, one unit of the lot being the lot, uh, the unit that has the, the current residence on it. Then you have another section that'd be big enough under the new home regulations to, um, to build whatever it is you're, you're planning on building. So that's a redwelling unit, standalone building, et cetera. And then you file a condominium regime that, that says, okay, this is unit one, this is unit two. Now they can both be, be separately owned legally, and that doesn't require a subdivision. So then we got to go look at the Declaration of Covenants, Conditions, and Restrictions that, that sets forth um, the restrictive covenants. For example, if there were a uh, prohibition against any use other than single family residential use, that's a type of a building. So we know what a single family residential uh, home is. It's one structure. It's not a duplex. It doesn't have um, a standalone accessory dwelling unit. It doesn't have um, additional buildings. It doesn't look like a compound. It's its own thing. Um, you know, other other restrictive covenants could be something like um, only one structure per um, per building unit, and then they'll define building unit as being the lot that was filed on the plat for subdivision. So that can be an issue as well. And then, of course, there's provisions um, in most homeowners association declarations that require any and all um, new buildings or modifications to be approved by our architectural control committee. There's a number of different ways that a homeowners association or B restrictions could potentially thwart one of these projects. And it just requires a complete review uh, of all the restrictive covenants in order to figure that out. So when you look like I live in Northwest Hills, right? So as we're talking about this and, you know, if I wanted to build um, a guest house or some sort of ADU. Uh, and it's not something that I've looked at. Eric uh, is having internet connection issues. So uh, he'll be back in a second. Um, but so when I'm looking at that, is that something, is that something, A, do you know if I can do that in Northwest Hills? B, if not, um, what is my process then to try to get someone to let me build either a guest house or a possible ADU, um, you know, that maybe I'd want to sell off or whatever. Um, that That's where I go through and I start filing a petition with you and, and, and reaching out to the neighbors, that, that whole thing. Exactly. And the easiest way, the, the, the little shortcut that I think works the best is to go grab your most recent title policy. You know, if you've, if you've purchased a property within the last five or 10 years, you're going to have a title policy. If you've, if you've bought it within the last three or four that title policy is going to come with, you know, usually a little hyperlink for each of the deed restrictions on Schedule B. And you can just go through there with, with your lawyer or if you're a licensed real estate professional and you feel comfortable doing it, you can scan all those documents. Now, sometimes there's 20 or 30 or 40 documents to go through and it can be tedious. Um, you know, that's what we do. So you, you scan those documents to determine if there are any prohibitions against what you're trying to do or if there is, are any architectural review authorities that you're going to have to get permission from. I can't tell you as I sit here if if what you want to do or hypothetically want to do in your scenario is possible in Northwest Hills because it's just more specific than that. And and it's it's true to say that every single property is unique in that, you know, you've got to go look at that title policy in order to know for sure what restrictive covenants apply. I mean, theoretically, you can figure it out if you're a title examiner and you want to go in and look at the, the deed records and go through the index and, and figure it out. Uh, but 
the 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 best way that I've found is is use the title policy as a tool in figuring out what is prohibited and what permissions you need. So if I don't have a title policy, I you know I bought my house five or ten years ago. I don't I don't have it. I don't know what I did with it. How do I go about? How do I go about getting that? Do I reach out to you? Do I pay a title company? What What's the best way to do I've that? I've got you. Actually, well, I'm doing <laughs> sorry. You drive down. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you drive down the airport. I'm not joking. And and you pay them five dollars, and they give you a microfish. Real, that's a real thing. And you will get your deed restrictions on the microfish. Do you know where the where you pay your? You used to pay your your annual property taxes if you wanted to like drive the check in. It's right by. I uh, I, I, I I don't uh, I don't pay a property. I don't pay property taxes, <laughs> Eric. I, I don't do that. Uh, that's one of the, I did, however, go down there to. Uh, I, I did go down there to update the title of my car, so I do know what you're talking. About. So one of the issues yeah, here is but, but, deed restrictions. They're not easy to find. Like Adam, you're saying that you have to. You know, you're correct. You go look at an old title policy, but if you can't, if you don't have that, you live in your home ten or fifteen years. You really have to go get them on microfiche from from the county. It's a big pain in the butt. Yeah, you can pay a title company four or five hundred bucks for a, a a report generally. But also, if you can remember at least who your title company was, they save those things indefinitely, um, and they will generally they will generally give those to you, um, and 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 give you the the, the copy. I had a, a, a client one time. This was, gosh, twenty twenty years ago. Um, looking at. Uh, he was an attorney buying a property in Allendale, I believe on Shoal Creek, and there were deed restrictions from way back when that still, you know, limited, um, quote unquote, colored, colored people from living in here, um, staying here too many, uh, too many nights in a row. in a row. I think it was like two and a half, no more than two and a half people for maybe three days or four days. I, I mean, it was... It was kind of crazy, A, that that was still there. And as I recall that situation, um, he really tried to get those removed uh, from the deed restrictions. Um, obviously, they're not enforceable. To my, the best of my recollection, he was not able to get those removed. And the reason being, well, they're not enforceable anyway, so we're not removing them. Are you, talking, you, about into old, that? Are you talking about the old racist deed restrictions? Sorry. Yes. Yeah. There, so yes. yeah, I've seen this effort. And, I mean, it's literally it, it's a, it's a great effort to try to. Um, it's it's a good show of care, right? <laughs> but they're one hundred percent unenforceable. And generally speaking, they aren't doing anything other than. I mean, they do they offend people, but it is sort of a good reminder of what land use code has done for a long time. What's interesting, I had lunch with uh, a friend today who is a professor at UT, and we were talking about. Uh, deed restrictions. You well, actually, it was, it was lunch with another builder friend, and he said that he prefers deed restrictions that are before the Civil Rights Act because they just painted them as like like they literally named the races that they didn't want in these areas, and those are not enforceable. After that, they then moved to classist language, where they said, you know, you can only have uh, one single family home on any lot, things like that. And so, as a developer, as an infill developer. It's much easier for him whenever it's an unenforceable deed restriction like that, right? Now, you know, there are these old deed restrictions that we still have to contend with if we want to build more than one unit on a lot of lots in, in Central Austin. To go back to Allendale as an example, there's no way anybody is putting more than one structure on a lot in Allendale. The neighbors are organized. Uh, they'll send a cease and desist really early. Uh, they'll get an injunction. And I've, I've literally watched it happen. I've watched, I've seen uh, this foundation framed up and then and then it stops right after that. And we have a question on the side that says, you know, how much good will the home initiative do with these deed restrictions that that trump the home initiative? And that remains to be seen. You know, people are pretty. Uh, there's a lot of ingenuity out there. People are going to figure out where they can add more density. Um, but the areas that are deed restricted, if the neighbors are organized, uh, there will not be additional density in those neighborhoods. Yeah, I agree. I mean, the, the short answer to the question: of What good does the home initiative do? In areas where there's deed restrictions that would prohibit what the home initiative allows, the short answer is nothing. It does nothing. You know, the, the, I, I have, you know, no desire to, to wade into the politics of this particular issue, but it, it doesn't do anything. The, the deed restrictions will trump that. But Max, I think, I think your point about the, you know, the old racist deed restrictions is interesting. And, and so, while we all know that those aren't enforceable, no one even would try, I think it's, it's, it's important to talk about the legal reason. 
And the legal reason why is that they are unenforceable because as a matter of law, they're illegal. They violate all kinds of federal protections, the Fair Housing Act, the Civil Rights Act of 1964, the, the, the 14th Amendment, um, and, and, and many, many others, um, and, and not in any particular order. And, and, and I think, Eric, your point, too, is interesting because when, when you've got deed restrictions that, that include that kind of stuff and you're trying to argue that, that something in there is unenforceable, it's great to bring the racist stuff up because who's going to want to enforce the, the document even? Now it taints the whole thing. And, and from, a, from a litigation standpoint in Travis County, if you show up and say, oh, judge, you know, these these deed restrictions that they're trying to enforce, you know, they've got they've got things about which races belong in which particular buildings. And and yeah, the servants quarters can have a particular race, but not the main house. And they're also trying to I mean, the judge stopped listening. You know, it's, it's we're not enforcing any of that now, even if legally you might be able to enforce parts of it. So, I, that, you know, that, that really happened that I because most builders I know are so risk averse that even if you have. Like they, they generally will not try to, to butt heads with the neighborhood association in court one way or the other. So I don't I, I don't have any experience with this. And that is very interesting to me that a judge will say, yeah, we should throw out this entire document because of how it's written. And there's other reasons to throw throw out deed restrictions as well. I mean, you've got waiver, you've got abandonment um, and, and you've got selective enforcement. And, and so I'll, I'll talk about those, too. And so. For example, if you have a deed restriction, forget home the home initiative for a minute because it's it's imagine that you're trying to do something that's allowed by the city, but disallowed by a particular covenant in in restrictive covenants. If you can ascertain that within the community governed by those restrictive covenants, that ten percent or more of a, of the community is violating, obviously violating. Um, a particular rule. Uh, the law says that the the neighborhood and the association, if there is one, has waived the right to enforce that deed restriction forever. And so, you know, if there's a hundred homes and you count thirteen that that have violated the deed restriction, you can rest pretty assured that they're not going to be able to enforce that. Now, to your point, though, Eric, no developer wants to go and get involved in litigation. And what I'm telling you is you'll you'll necessarily be involved if, if anybody cares. So how it would work is you you would you would get that title policy. It would point out those deed restrictions. You'd take it to your lawyer and you'd say, but I think they've waived it. And so your lawyer would have to go, well, here, there's only one way to find out. And that's either apply to the Architectural Control Committee and, and, and have the conversation with them where they tell you you can or you can't do it. They tell you you can't. You let them know they've waived it. If they say forget about it, you do it anyway, or you file a lawsuit, uh, and then that lawsuit uh, will adjudicate whether or not that's an enforceable deed restriction. But the, the case law is so clear, uh, and, and, and the idea behind that is not just some arbitrary number um, of 10%. The idea is that without the deed restrictions in your hand, without those restrictive covenants, you should be able to drive around the neighborhood and accurately like those deed restrictions by just observing. And, and I think it's a good rule because it's it's one that anybody can do. You don't have to be a lawyer. You don't have to be a licensed real estate agent. You can just use your eyeballs and a pad of paper and and figure out what rules should and shouldn't be enforced um, based on the rules of equity. So, you know, that's, that's one way to do it. And then, of course, there's abandonment. And that's when the entire regime of deed restrictions has been so either haphazardly or, or enforced or not enforced at all for such a long period of time that we can all say, look, those are from 1927. Nobody's doing that anymore, you know? Um, and then and then the whole thing's out the window and, and people can do anything they want and then it's used to. Let you me know, ask you that's, this. Uh, there's, a, there's a question in here, a comment rather, that deed restrictions, he says, what about deed, what about deed restrictions that are not actively enforced? There's some neighborhoods in South Austin that are zoned SF3 without HOA have deed restrictions established from the 50s that have not been enforced for decades. Developers continue to build. I've actually run into uh, this specifically in South Austin. There's a couple of uh, condo projects, multiple unit condo projects, not a not an AB unit, um, where technically uh, the way the deed restrictions read, and I don't have them in front of me, but it was essentially like you you can't build multifamily uh, projects in here, um, but it's been going on forever and ever. Um, 
and it kind of came up. We 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 ultimately title insured it and we closed it and and moved on. But but that it did come up through the loan process, trying to figure out. Well, hold on, like how how is this happening? How did it happen? Uh, what is a the first thing I have to figure out as well? What is my risk to have a uh, a sellable loan when I go to send that to Fannie or Freddie? And obviously, if title's fully insuring me, it's fine. But we did go down that road, and I found it to be quite interesting that that that's been going on for for quite some time. So yeah. specifically for that kind of building. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the real answer is what you had was an, either an inchutment or a, a, a uh, uh, ignorant developer. And one way or the other, they got away with it. And, and, and by getting away with it, they encouraged somebody else to get away with it. And at some point in time, the old phrase, there goes the neighborhood, applies. And, and there goes the neighborhood. And so, you know, you've got 100 lots and, and three you know, multifamily uh, complexes built on three of the, the hundred, you might not be the 10% uh, number yet, but why wouldn't you go build the fourth one, right? And so then it's just, it, it, it's just a matter of getting away with it. Yeah. Like, and that's really what it is. Deed restrictions are, are an interesting, are an interesting area of the law because um, you, it, it's kind of expensive to enforce them. I mean, if, if you came to me, Max, and you said, listen, my neighbor, it is building something. I don't think he he should be building it. Uh, and you showed me the deed restrictions. I said I agree with you. Uh, you know I'm going to ask you for a five or a ten thousand dollar retainer because these fights are are personal. They get dragged out. They're and they're expensive. So you're going to have to cough up five or ten grand um, to to stop somebody from from doing something. And um, and if you're not willing to do that, or you don't have a coalition of neighbors willing to spend the money, then nobody's going to challenge the development. And it's going to happen anyway. And now it's a it, it's it's the two paces out of the two. And so now you got you got the momentum. It's happening. People are getting away with it. Nobody's questioning it. And and then you just have one after the other until you actually get to a place where it's been legally waived, uh, or or you know there's nobody's going to do anything about it. Um, and that's that's the reality of it. And that's really how it happens. What I've what I've observed in in talking about the old deed restrictions, the 1920s or whatnot. You know, city of Austin uh, is generally more expensive the closer you get to the metal, right? The the neighborhoods are also older the closer you get to the metal. And these neighborhoods become more expensive. As they become more expensive, the residents are wealthier and they're more prone to enforcing deed restrictions and more prone to organize. So while the deed restrictions might become more difficult in a neighborhood like Terrytown, do you think it would be more problematic to build against those deed restrictions, even though they might be easier to litigate in court. It, 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 it's going to be tough. I mean, the, the, the legal analysis is, is going to be the same. Uh, strategically, you know, are the, are the folks in Terrytown going to have enough money to get together and stop you is probably a pretty easy question to answer. And it, it's just going to be a matter of whether they care or not, whether there's uh, an association that's, that's enforced these restrictions or not, and, and, and whether or not, um, you know, the, the facts line up with um, with the prohibition, but if there's a deed restriction that says, you know, yeah. one, one building per lot and, and nobody's violated it yet, that's going to be tough to, that's going to be tough to get around. So I, I, I don't imagine there's going to be a lot of, there aren't going to be a lot of, of deed restrictions being waived because of the home initiative, um, that weren't already waived. I, I think it's the best way to answer that. Makes sense. We see a lot of density east. That probably is where we continue to see see density. Would you agree with that? Oh, I've certainly seen seen that um, as far as as far as the the um, projects I worked on, and you know that's the other thing that I think is interesting. It theoretically, allows allows these these accessory dwelling units or whatever you want to call them to be built on already existing lots. That's 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 the the reality is there's already a file plat. There are already lots and blocks. And everything else, and so so, how are we going to come in and and chop these lots up uh, into you know eighteen hundred square foot lots without a re subdivision? And the easiest answer is you file a condominium regime. And I've been doing a lot of those over the last you know six seven years, where usually it's an it's it's an A and a B unit. Maybe we tear down a, a piece of property, uh, and we, we build an A and a B unit. Or more recently, we've been been doing a lot of the ADUs where we've got a good sized backyard. We're going to put a 650 square foot 
ADU back there. Sometimes it's one story, sometimes it's two stories. But for about any, somewhere between 15 and 2,500 bucks, you can get a condominium regime in place and all the documents necessary. And you don't have to get approval from the city. And you don't have to, I mean, you need building permits and those kinds of things, but you don't have to get a, a re-subdivision approved. You don't have to get um, these other these other things that have to be done when you file a plat um, um, with the city or, or the county. And it's a lot easier than to build what you want, sell it off separately, sell it together to one investor. Um, and, and, and then that, of course, you know, if you can take a lot and you can, you can build four units, it still works. If you can build six, how the new regime works. Um, and that's really what we're talking about. And that's really what the city, I think, expects to see um, with this initiative. It's what they, so I'm learning more and more about it as we go. I've, I've had the, the pretty strong opinion that, you know, the areas that I like to be active in are deed restricted. So probably can't do a whole lot, which I still think that, but the, the intention of home is pretty interesting. So they're allowing you, are you familiar with the impervious coverage? And then you have FAR value, which FAR is what, what tells you how much square footage you can build. And they're keeping FAR the same, meaning you can only build 40% of the size of the lot uh, if you put one unit. But then they let you go to 55 if uh, if you build two units. And I think 66 or 67% if you go to three units. So they're incentivizing more density by way of square footage on a lot. Now, there's other things you have to adhere to, like I see... Yeah, trees, things like that. But they're really trying to get three units on lots that will allow them. And that's why I think you'll see the deed restrictions become uh, very much at play as neighbors don't like seeing these ADUs very much. Well, what, what happens whenever we start putting three units on a fifth of an acre lot? I think people are going to push back on that pretty hard. Well, and then, and then you're going to have parking issues and everything else. And, and you know, it's a chicken and an egg problem. If, if we've got a super dense city, who needs parking? You can just walk wherever you want to go. Um, but until it becomes super dense, where are you going to park your car? And so um, I think those are some of the issues that we're going to bump up against. You know, you're going to run out of curves to park on um, before you end up with uh, the density you need to be a, a a true, you know, what are they calling it? The, the, the 10 minute city where you can, you can walk 10 minutes to everything you need, um, which is a great goal, but the growing pains getting there is what we're looking at right now. It's where, where am I going to park? Where am I going to put these properties? You know, how do you balance the idea that, you know, we've got these big, beautiful heritage oak trees that we don't want to chop down, um, but we also want to plop three units onto one lot. And then we have impervious cover, which is, which is a, a, a very reasonable thing to care about because if you don't, if you don't absorb all the, uh, the rainfall and runoff, then what do you have? Well, you know, I hate to keep picking off Houston, but then you have Houston right. um, and everybody's, everybody's, everything's concrete and, and the water doesn't have a place to go um, and there's nowhere to soak it up. Um, not, not suggesting any of those considerations is more important than the other, but they all come into play uh, when you're trying to you know, upscale your density. Question here, and this is a pretty nuts and bolts question. Genevieve asked, is there such a thing as something being grandfathered in if a neighbor has a unit that is violating deed restrictions? Yeah. Yeah, and and I think the way to to really look at that is is there is a four year statute of limitations on enforcing deed restrictions. So we've talked about waiver, we've talked about abandonment, but there's also the statute of limitations. You know, the one that I get all the time um, is uh, somebody's got a shed, and we want to get rid of it. It violates the deed restrictions. Well, how long has it been there? Well, it's been there for six years. We're sick of it. After four years. <laughs> You lose the right to you lose the right to get rid of it. So um, it's important to remember that there is a four year statute limitations on that. And, and the way that 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 um, uh, you know we've we've usually been in, invited into those issues are um, I'm representing the homeowners association. A new board of directors is elected. Um, they are the new sheriff in town, and they pull out those deed restrictions, and they just go down the list, and they're going to get everybody for everything. Um, and the first question I have to ask them after they've spent, you know, days and sometimes weeks on this project that they undertook without talking to me first is how long have these things been there? And, and the response is usually, oh, they've been there forever. The last boards stunk. They didn't, they didn't enforce any of this stuff. And the problem is after four years, you lose it. Um, the, you know, that's, that's. I think the answer to that question. So, so Max is what he's a neighbor of mine, and he just started parking this busted El Camino, 
out in front of his house. So he's only been doing it for a couple. This is of not weeks. true. This is not true. I park. I park it in the garage, and my wife's car got moved to the street. Thank you, sir, <laughs> because I need to counterbalance it by charging my Tesla. <laughs> I'm glad. I'm glad the Tesla's on the street and the uh, El Camino's in the in the garage. That's priorities, man. The priorities are definitely set straight. Um, more serious question that did. Go I was ahead. gonna say they did uh, back back before I got it done. Uh, it was sitting out in front of my house for quite some time with the flat tire and it wasn't running. Uh, and the city did come through and slapped a big orange uh, sticker on there and said I needed to move this uh, abandoned vehicle or they were going to uh, remove it for me. That's code though, and so that's not deed restrictions. That's a neighbor calling three one one, and you know trying to use that trying to use that out and maybe get what they want. I think that there are a couple, there, there's two sides to this, right? You have people that really want to, you know, push things, well, probably three sides. You have people that just don't care and they, their houses look like hell and all the neighbors dislike them, right? That's a pretty easy one to say, mow your lawn. But then you have people that are really for density, for, you know, changing code and, and seeing things evolve. And then you have people that don't want things to change. Like we said earlier, we're not going to wade into that debate and say which is the right side. But but those are the two concerns with deed restrictions. Adam, I ride my bike through Jester, and I see signs up in Jester that they're concerned about, they're, they're, you know, save single family zoning. These guys are really concerned that there's going to be four plexes, six plexes, three units to a lot in Jester. What do you think the likelihood of, of something like that is there? Uh, almost zero. You know, every time the city does this stuff, um, there's some discussion that, hey, let's make it, let's make it Trump deed restrictions. And and, and sometimes there's a discussion and sometimes it just comes right off the table. Um, I think for a number of reasons, the city can't ask a, 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 a municipal ordinance, the ordinance that would trouble deed restrictions. I think certainly federal law that interprets the Constitution, yeah. certainly you can't violate someone's constitutional rights with deed restrictions. But remember, these deed restrictions are a private contract that runs with the land. Um, and those are supposed to be enforced as long as they're not illegal. So the idea that the city would come in after the fact and say, your deed restrictions are, are hereby null and void with respect to this issue, I, I don't think that that is a, I don't think there should really be a concern about that. I, I don't see that happening. Now, we may be on a call in two years and I have to apologize because I'm wrong and the city came in and, 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 is, and is trying to you know bulldoze their way through that issue. Um, but I just don't see the, the, the legal uh, or the political will to to go against such a a, a fundamental property right um, that's been that way for a couple hundred years in Texas. I just don't see that. I think that's probably a misunderstanding of the initiative, um, which I don't blame anybody for having. Um, when they roll this stuff out, they're usually not that great at explaining it. Yeah, so I you know house, there's housing shortage nationwide, and you are seeing this addressed the state level in, in some areas, Colorado being one. Colorado is either just pushed out or they're in the process of pushing out some uh, some land use code at the state level. This is just a hypothetical because I don't think it would happen in Texas for a number of reasons. But do you think that if if there were law passed at the state level that it could override new restrictions? It's possible. I, I You know, every couple of years, the legislature gets together um, and some some years they decide to really really change the landscape for homeowners associations and the enforcement of deed restrictions. And then sometimes they kind of leave us alone in our guard. The last couple of times, it's been pretty, pretty tame. At 10 or 12, 14 years ago now, there was a big overhaul. You know, every 10 or 15 years, they do that. Uh, I can see that coming again. But I, I, don't, I don't think at the state level, there's the support, and yeah, I said we can get political, but I don't right. think there's the political support at the state level to override deed restrictions in such a in such a fundamental way um, that would then allow, you know, this this Austin Austin based density project to go forward on a statewide level. I don't see that happening. Got it. What's the craziest neighbor to neighbor dispute you've had to deal with in the past? The past, I don't know. Right, let's make it 10 years. What's your favorite crazy, crazy dispute? Well, my favorite one to talk about is um, an emotional support chicken case that I had. The worst, most ridiculous one is one I had just very recently where we had a, a multiple day trial 
where one neighbor was suing another neighbor for about 40 individual uh, deed restriction violations that ranged from you took rocks from your backyard and you put them in your front yard, uh, which which I would say was one of the, the worst violations, um, to uh, as, as ridiculous as um, the guys you hired to mow your yard um, accidentally mowed about two feet into my yard. Um, and, and, and everything in between, there, there, were, there was a complaint that my client dug a hole and filled it back in. Um, was there a was a complaint that uh, uh, there were some trees, some cedar trees that my client had cut some branches off of, and that was a violation. So it, it was pretty ridiculous. And the guy that had filed that lawsuit claimed to have spent $350,000 uh, litigating that issue, um, which... If he would have paid half of that money to my clients, they would have let him run around their backyard doing whatever he wanted. And, uh, you know, it wouldn't have been a big deal. The whole thing, you know, with, with deed restrictions, especially when you're talking about homeowners associations, is you get real close to people's homes and they get real sensitive about that stuff. Whether it's, whether it's a homeowners association telling somebody, you know, you really ought to mow your yard, the, the weeds are about three feet high right. to, um, to, to people saying, you know, you, you can't have your babysitting business because that's a commercial use. You, you end up with some issues that, you know, it's pretty easy to see both sides and navigating through that to try to bring some peace to, to folks versus just enforcing the, the black and white rules um, is really where, where I think lawyers can bring some value uh, to putting things back into perspective um, in a way that, that I think is important. Think, do you think a lot of that's... A, you just have neighbors that hate each other and, and you know, going to do everything to make someone's life miserable. It seems to me that more of that may actually be uh, an inability to uh, deal with confrontation. So they come and get you involved so they don't actually have to have what they, you know, an uncomfortable or tough conversation with a neighbor uh, of such. Do you think that that's a lot of what you end up seeing because people just can't talk to each other? It is. There, there's a lot of that. And, you know, again, I, I don't know what the, the, the reason for it is. I don't know if people just get so used to doing everything by email and text message that they won't go knock on the door and say, hey, uh, you know, this bothers me. What, w would you mind fixing it? You know, I, I tell people all the time when they, they're like, hey, why don't you write this demand letter? Or, hey, let's file a lawsuit. Um, I say, OK, well, tell me about um, what the what your neighbor said to you when you went and first approached them about this problem. And they're like, what? I don't have to talk to them. So it's like, well, okay, but you know, you want to give me five grand to write a letter or do you want to knock on your neighbor's door and see if you could you know, figure out the, the problem? Um, you know, it, it, you just bake, baked it, bake it down some cookies and take it over there and say, Hey, I made you some cookies. Also, maybe see if you could bring the dog inside when he's barking. Um, you know, that's why you have a job. I mean, we always complain, and say, God, why can't everybody just be cool and reasonable in these transactions? But I go, hey, we wouldn't have a job if that were the case. And, yeah. you know, I think, I think as developers start to figure out where the opportunities are, then we'll see a lot more analysis of these deed restrictions to make sure that, that, that um, they're able to do it. You know, the developers are also used to this. So this, this, this isn't making things more complicated. It's, it's relaxing some of the rules that prohibited this stuff in the first place. Um, but it's just one set of rules. As I mentioned, you've got code requirements, you've got site plan requirements, you've got conditional use permits, and then you've got deed restrictions. And those have always been there. And so now we're eliminating one barrier to a denser city, but there still are others, others to go. And so um, I, I don't think we'll see as much as people are worried about the, the folks that are complaining and worried that this is going to change everything, I think you're going to see that die down as well when nothing happens. It's um, going to be, like I said, it's been less than 100 of these so far. It's going to be interesting to see how many treeless lots people can find to, to put three units on. You know, the, the tree department it does not let you cut much down these days. So there, there's, a, like you said, there's a lot of obstacles. Watershed is a pain to deal with. There's no way that they're going to relax 45% impervious coverage. So that becomes difficult to, you know, to put three units if you're only, if you're only covering up 45% of the lot. Um, I'm with you. I think that uh, a lot of times when people are really, really concerned about massive change, 
most of the time it's not as extreme as everybody's afraid of. I think that's right. I, I think there's a there's there's a, there's a lot of noise being made and, and then that stirs up a lot of concern. And I think I think these types of podcasts and these types of discussions go a long way in easing those concerns. A lot of people are worried about change. And you know, they move into somewhere and they want it to look like how they moved in for the rest of their lives. And in a lot of instances that's gonna be possible. But in a lot of other instances, it's not. The world changes around us and 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 you have to adapt to that. But I also think that it changes a lot slower than people generally are worried about it happening. And even even if even if it trumped the deed restrictions, you still have to have developers that see that see the opportunity to make a profit. And and some lots just aren't going to be uh, valuable for that purpose. So I, I think there's, there's still a lot of, there's still a lot of, of, um, impediments to putting, you know, two more units in somebody's backyard, just because you could potentially say there's 1800 square feet back there. Um, you know, that's tiny and, and it's going to be very hard to put anything that anybody would want to buy from you, um, on an 1800 square foot spot you know that's less than 50 feet by 50 feet I mean, that's that's with, very by small way, by the way with no parking requirements and so, yeah and forget yeah. about parking right right and so you know if you want yeah. to buy maybe, this maybe you could have some limes yeah some lime charging stations out in front one thing if there's one thing we can all rally around and agree upon it's that everybody loves the lime scooters littered around the city right so we just need more we just need more of those I mean, I love them. There you I go. certainly want. To, I certainly want to see more in in my front yard. Um, they are fun to ride downtown, though. Adam, I appreciate something you just said. Um, in general, change is scary. People don't like change. They typically don't like change because they don't know what it's going to look like on the other side, uh, and so they're fearful about it. So, by having podcasts uh, like this one, um, you know, we can kind of talk about what that is and and you know that's something we really try to do on this podcast in general whether it's deed restrictions or agent commission or loan guideline changes uh whatever it may be so um yeah i mean I, I, thanks for for saying that it's uh really what we're trying to uh to do here well it's a great service i'm happy to be part of it well We'd we love really to appreciate back. you uh being on yeah it's you always bring a lot of wisdom and knowledge, and we always learn a lot from you. So thank you for uh, for being a part of this. Well, thanks for having me. I'll come back anytime. It awesome. is.